are in our study thus far of uh, the return from captivity is the, uh, the Jews have returned, a remnant has returned, and they have rebuilt just the foundation of the temple. They started to rebuild the whole temple, but all they got done was the foundation and the, the enemies in the land um, scared them and, and frustrated their work and made them stop. And so they just gave up and quit working on the temple. And uh, so 16 years have gone by. And so they, they've really just been focusing on building their own houses instead of building up the house of the Lord. And uh, do you remember the message of Haggai that Brian talked about Wednesday night? What was, how do we summarize Haggai? <laughs> the memory device, remember? Hey, get back to work, right? Or hey guys, get back to work. So Haggai, hey guys, get back to work. And so let's, let's get back to work on the temple. Did they get back to work on the temple? They did. At least some of them did. And they, I mean, and they immediately started, started working on the, the temple to, to rebuild it. And that is a good thing. Now, Zechariah is contemporaneous with Haggai. Uh, he, he begins his oracles almost at the exact time. It's like two months after Haggai. And he has a similar message. But there is a difference in the focus. Zechariah is a longer book. Zechariah is the longest of the minor prophets. Uh, minor prophets are minor because of the size of their books. And major prophets are called major prophets because of the size of their books. Zechariah is the longest of the minor prophets. It's a very, very long book. And it's <clears throat> 14 chapters. And, uh, I mean, for minor prophets, it's very long. And uh, I don't remember what I was going to say. Oh, I was going to say this. So, he, he doesn't just talk about rebuilding the temple. Whereas Haggai's emphasis is more on rebuilding the physical temple, Zechariah's emphasis is more on building the spiritual temple. And he looks forward to the, the Messianic era uh, a lot in this book. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to introduce the book of Zechariah, and then we're going to touch on different parts of chapters 1 through 4. All right? That's what we're going to do today. Um, so... I have given it this title, the, the memory device, since Zechariah starts with the letter Z. The message of the book is zeal for Zion. All right, two Z words there. That really is, I think, the overarching message that in this ultimate temple that the Lord would build, uh, and in the day of the, the, this branch, this one who is both priest and king who will come, uh, God will glorify His people, and He will bring in all the nations into this heavenly Jerusalem, and He will defeat His enemies. I mean, that's kind of the overarching message of the book. So I think it's sum up, summed up there nicely, zeal for Zion, and, and that idea of the spiritual Zion, all right, is really the main emphasis. Such a deep book. And the word Zechariah, the name Zechariah, means the Lord has remembered the Lord has remembered, which is fitting because the book is about God remembering His people and not forgetting them and not, not forgetting this work which He wanted to accomplish through them in the temple. Uh, Zechariah was a priest. We know that from Nehemiah 12 and verse 16. <clears throat> and I don't know, that to me just adds a new layer of meaning to so many of these passages in the book that are about priesthood. Here's an outline of the book, the first eight chapters are visions, and these are wild visions. I mean, they are bizarre a lot of times. It helps them to really stick in your head, and it makes it confusing. So the book's confusing, but I'm going to try to make it simple. The second part of the book, 9 through 14, are oracles, two oracles. And we're not going to get to those until later next quarter, but we're going to be covering, I'm going to be covering the first four chapters, and then we're not having class Wednesday because of singing night. And uh, next Sunday, Brian is going to take chapters 5 through 8. A little difference from what's in your syllabus. So 1 through 4 today, 5 through 8 um, next Sunday. Here's the, the point that I want to emphasize. And we're really going to be looking at the portions of chapters 1 through 4 that make this point. God makes the impossible possible. You put yourself in the shoes, uh, sandals I guess you could say, of, of these Israelites in, in this day. Um, you know, they, they had come back with all this excitement, come back from captivity to, to the land and started rebuilding the temple and then that work gets put to, put to a stop. It's been 16 years. 
they'd kind of given up hope, you know? And uh, they just kind of think, you know, it's not really possible. It's not really doable to rebuild this temple, at least not right now. And God's message is, yes, it is. It is possible. In fact, God is going to tell them, I'm going to be able to do far more than you're able to conceive with regard to, to the temple. That's where it gets really awesome. So let me just kind of skim over chapter 1. It starts out, verses 1 through 6, with this call to repentance. Look at verse 3. Therefore, <clears throat> say to them, God is telling Zechariah, Thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, Haggai had already told the people, get back to work on the temple, and uh, the people did, but there were those who did not. I believe that here Zechariah is addressing those who still had not gotten involved in the work. He's saying, hey, repent. You're in sin if you're not getting involved in the work the Lord wants you to do. And it's so ironic, this return language. These were the returnees. And God is saying to them, return to me. And they're thinking, we already did. We came back to the land. And he's saying, no, you haven't returned to me in your heart. So they return to the land, but they at this point did not return to the Lord until they repent. And then God can have that covenant relationship with them. Um, <clears throat> then we have this uh, vision, starting verse 7, of this, uh, this man on, on a horse. And this is uh, the angel of the Lord, a significant character all through the Old Testament. And he's on this red horse. And there are these other men on horses, and they're patrolling the earth. And what do they discover about the nations of the earth? What is their status right now? At ease. They're at ease, right, Terry? I mean, it's just, but are God's people at ease? No. Not at all. How does God feel about that? Well, he's not happy about that. And so he wants to, he wants to reverse that situation, and uh, he wants to bring judgment on the enemies, and he wants to have compassion on Jerusalem. I just want to read a couple of verses from that section. Um, this is, I want to read, no, no, I'm going to read in a little bit. We're just going to kind of keep moving. Um, I've got a lot I, I need to cover. There's this, this other vision at the end of chapter one of these four horns. Now, what do you think a horn kind of represents? Strength, power, you know, animals have got horns and everything. So four horns, what do you think the number four is symbolic of? Uh, yeah, four corners of the earth. And so the four horns here symbolize the, all of the kingdoms of the world that are against God and His purposes. And there are these craftsmen in the vision. They're going to just terrify these horns and uh, cast them down. And the idea is God's, God's going to do away with all of the resistance that's out there in these, in these judgments, uh, in these nations. He's, he's going to overpower them and bring about His purpose. Usually... When we get, we, we get into the weeds on these visions, usually the point is super simple. So I like super simple. So I'm going to try to make it super simple. Y'all like that? That's my goal. Now, let's, let's slow down here in chapter 2. And we're going to get practical here in a, in a minute. Verse 1, Then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a man with a measuring line in his hand. Now, they didn't have Lowe's where you could go and buy your own you know, uh, measuring tape. But that's basically, in their day, this was a measuring tape. It was a measuring line. It was a cord that, that had a certain length that you could measure things with. And uh, <clears throat> verse 2, so I said, where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem, to see how wide it is and how long it is. Now, I believe that this and this vision represents those Jews who were only concerned about physical Jerusalem. Physical Jerusalem. That portion of actual land that, that belonged to them and, and everything and there are Jews today, and that's all they're concerned about is physical Jerusalem. So God's going to make a point. There's more to this than physical Jerusalem. Look at verse 3. And behold, the angel who was speaking with me was going out. Okay, so can you just kind of picture that? Here's the angel who's been speaking with him. He's going, he's going out. And another angel was coming out to meet him. So there's two angels now. And that other angel said to him, Run! Speak to that young man, saying, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls. Because of the multitude of men and cattle within it. For I, declares the Lord, will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Now let me ask you a question. There in verse 3, do you think that 
The reference there is physical Jerusalem, this city without walls, or spiritual Jerusalem. This, it's obviously spiritual. How do we know it's not physical Jerusalem? Yeah, did God have a plan to, in the return, you know, I'm just going to make sure my city does, doesn't have walls? No. Kind of the opposite, right? Who would come and build walls? <laughs> Nehemiah. So God obviously had a plan for a city to have walls. But he is saying this city will have no walls. Why? There's going to be too many people. You won't be able to fit them in the city, right? You won't be able to fit them in here. There's going to be so many people. And, uh, and you know, what's going to be the, the wall? God Himself. God Himself. So this is, this is spiritual Jerusalem that is being talked about here. And in the New Testament, the writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 12, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. You know, church of Christ is not the only term that is biblical. Here's another biblical one, church of the firstborn. That's what we've come to. This, that's the universal church. This body of Christ is this heavenly Jerusalem. Are there any walls around that city? No, there are no walls. There's an innumerable multitude. And if you think about the... The church in its fullest sense includes not only people who are alive who are in the church, but people who have already died who are in the church. The church is without walls. Now, in what sense is God a wall of fire around spiritual Jerusalem? I think by His providence He helps us. Okay. okay. By the providence, he helps us. So, what else? Protector. Protector. In what way? There's a wall of fire around us. No one can get to us. Can get to us to do what? In what way? Thank you. Yes, spiritually. You know, First Thess or Second Thessalonians. Thess Second. Thessalonians 3 and verse 3. But the Lord is faithful, and He will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. You know, and passages like in Philippians 4, that, that this peace of God will protect us, you know, uh, guard our hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. So yes, God, God is protecting us. He's protecting us from evil. You remember in the model prayer, what did Jesus say to pray? But lead us not into temptation, but... Deliver us from evil or from the evil one. So what does that mean for us practically? That God is our wall of fire. He's protecting us. How does that help us like in a daily way? I think just like we talked about earlier, just that we're being accused. There are, there are powers at play in the world, you know, nationwide and, and even around the world that would attack Christians. Good. We see persecutions in, in a lot of places and God, we just have to know God knows that and God is in control. Yeah. And he will so what if we get killed physically and we're in Christ? Is God still protecting us? He is. He's guarding our, our souls. Yeah. You see what a comfort that is? There is literally nothing that this world can do to us if we're in Christ Jesus. There's literally nothing Satan can do to us as long as we maintain that relationship with, 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 with our Lord. He protects us. It's powerful. It's comforting. Anything else, Jack? As long as we're willing to look for that way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. When temptation is overtaken, even such as is common to man. All right, very good. So, to come back to our point, God makes the impossible possible. The Jews thought the temple was impossible to rebuild, and they could not conceive of, you know, God's going to do something far grander and greater than what you can possibly imagine with this physical temple. He's going to bring in a, he's going to, he, he's going to restore his people to a heavenly Jerusalem without walls. It's a wonderful thought. So as we move forward here, verses 6 through 13, there's this call to flee from the daughter of Babylon. So apparently those who were still out there in captivity 
Even though Babylon had been destroyed, the daughter of Babylon would be like the, 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 the children of Babylon, so to speak. And so only a remnant had returned. So God is calling all to come. He wants more than just these 50,000 that had returned to come. But again, this is, that's kind of on the surface. That's the meaning. But there is, I, I think, a deeper meaning. And, I, and I'm pretty confident in what I'm saying here because of verses 10 through 13. Sing for joy and be glad, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst declares the Lord. Now, how would God dwell in their midst? What was the symbol of His dwelling in their midst? The temple. So that's really the underpinning here. Verse 11, Many nations will join themselves to the Lord in that day and will become My people. Then I will dwell in your midst and you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent Me to you. Now, is this talking about many na like Gentile nations are going to come and dwell in Jerusalem and worship at the temple, the physical temple? Obviously, this is talking about the same thing we are talking about earlier. This heavenly Jerusalem. And many nations have been brought in. And what is the temple in the New Testament? It is the church. It is you and I. And there, you know, we don't have time to look at all the passages about that. There are many. Powerful stuff. We're not going to um, really go into chapter 3 because I pretty much already covered that in the Lord's Supper talk. But let me just kind of recap it real quick, um, just, just in case. Uh, basically, this vision that Zechariah has of Joshua the high priest and Satan is ready to accuse him of sin. And what do we say happens to Joshua? He's wearing these filthy garments. What happens to him? He is, he is given clean clothes. He changes. He is forgiven. And that defeats the purposes of Satan to, to try to defeat God's plan. And there's this beautiful prophecy about the branch. Now, I'm not really going to talk about that much because we're really going to get into that uh, next week, Brian is going to get into that in chapter 6. And so we're just going to kind of keep, keep on moving here. This is where I want to spend the most time. This vision in chapter 4 is really, really awesome. Chapter 4. So this is a vision of a lampstand and two olive trees. Verse 1. Then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me. Why would he have to rouse him? This was exhausting. And it was night. These are night visions. This is a series of night visions. And so it's like, wake up. i got something to tell you. And uh, it says, as a man who is awakened from sleep. Verse 2, he said to me, what do you see? And so I just kind of picture Zechariah. He's just sort of waking up and he's wiping his eyes. And, he's, and it says, and I, and I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with its bowl on top of it and its seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on the top of it. Also two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on its left side. Now I want to skip down just for a second down to verse 12. This is later obviously when he is asking more about can you explain these two olive trees? And we get a little bit more information here about the lampstand. In verse 12, and I answered the second time and said to him, what are the two olive branches which are beside the two golden pipes which empty the golden oil? from themselves. So that kind of gives us a full picture. Now, to help us understand this, I want to start by talking about the lampstand that was in the temple. Okay? Here's a picture of what that lampstand looked something like. Right? Now, this lampstand had uh, seven, seven um, lamps, and each one of them had its own reservoir for oil. And the priest would have to put the olive oil or whatever oil into the... I'm sure there was a specific kind of oil, and I'm ashamed to say I don't remember if it was olive oil, but it is in the vision. So oil. Uh, and put the oil in each one of the bowls and trim the lamps. Now, what was the difference between that lampstand and the lampstand that Zechariah sees? Okay. Did, it, was there a priest that had to be involved? No priest had to be involved. No human um, intervention. So these olive trees had these pipes, 
and the oil would go straight from the pipes. And where would the, where would the oil go into? One bowl, right? One bowl. So there weren't these seven bowls. And then what came from that one bowl to go out to each of the lamps? Pipes. Okay? So just try to get the picture. So Zechariah understood this lamp, and God showed him a different lamp. Can we kill the two pulpit lights? It just says pulpit above it because it's hard to see. Uh, this is a uh, drawing of what the lamp might have looked something like. You see this, this bowl here and the pipes going out to each one of the arms. And you see these two pipes coming in. That's not a very good drawing. Um, this one is not very good either. I mean, it's kind of strange. Like, that's just a huge bowl, and it doesn't look anything like that. I think it probably looked like, you know, the, the candelabrum that was, was in the temple. Uh, <clears throat> plus, these two trees look really creepy, and uh, they represent the two witnesses, and that's why they look that way. This is a more modern rendition. Um, th this one's not that accurate either, but who knows exactly what it looked like. But, you know, Zechariah is seeing this thing, and he, he, he's, he's baffled as to what, what it means, right? <clears throat> so let's, let's kind of unpack the meaning now. Verse 4, Then I said to the angel who was speaking with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? <laughs> and I said, No, my Lord. And we just see this pattern over and over in these visions. It's, you know, what is this? You don't know? No, I don't know. <laughs> Please tell me. Uh, Zechariah was the one seeing the vision, and he didn't understand it. If he actually saw it, and he didn't understand it, do you think there's a, a good excuse if we don't get it right off the bat? Yeah, it, it's okay if you don't get it. it. This is tough stuff, right? This is really tough stuff. But, um, but anyway, so we continue reading there. Let me pick up where I was. It was in verse 6. Verse 6, then he said to me, now pay attention. This is where it gets good. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Pause. Hold on. Let's soak this in. Who is Zerubbabel, y'all? All right. So there were two leaders at the time of the return. There was the civic leader and the religious leader. The civic leader was the governor Zerubbabel who was, by the way, in the line of David. And who was the religious leader? Joshua, Joshua the high priest. We've been talking about him, right? So, so I want you to put yourself in Zerubbabel's, again, sandals for a minute. Sixteen years ago, you, you led the people to, to rebuild this temple. So 16 years ago from now would be 2003. That gives you some frame of reference how long ago this was. And you've just kind of given up. You think Zerubbabel was a little discouraged? I think he was incredibly discouraged. And what God is doing through Zacharias, he's giving him encouragement here in this verse. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, that this task will be accomplished not by might, nor by power. Now, the word might is a word that literally means army or military. So not by military might, nor by power, not by human means, but by what? The by the Spirit. Did they have any military might or human power that could have overpowered the, the numerous enemies around them that prevented them from doing what they want? Of course not. But God doesn't have to have a lot, does He? Now, just like in the vision, there was no human intervention at causing this lamp to shine and to continue to have the oil poured within it. So God does not have to rely on human power to bring about His purposes. He will accomplish it by His what? Spirit. By His Spirit. And I believe that that ample oil coming in from these two olive trees is representative of the work of the Spirit. Do you think there's ample supply there to accomplish what God wants Him to accomplish? to bring forth the shining forth of God's glory and God's will. I, I get chills when I think about this stuff. This, I, we need the Old Testament. This stuff is so 
powerful. And I'll, I'll be honest with y'all. Studying these passages has strengthened my faith. When I get up and I say this is faith building, I'm saying it's building my faith, y'all, because it is. It, it, is, it, is, it is powerful. Now, anyway, as, uh, as we go into the next verse, uh, verse 7, it gets even better. What are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. What is the mountain that he's talking about? What do you think the mountain is that's being referenced here? Somebody who hasn't answered? You got, you got something, a thought? What is the mountain? Represents Sir? It represents kingdoms. Kingdoms, okay. A lot of times in, in uh, prophecy, mountains represent kingdoms. That's a possibility. What else could it maybe represent? There's a, king, there's a mountain that's going to be made into a plain. What do you think the basic idea of that is? I'm getting really simple. Opposition. Opposition. Obstacle. There's some big obstacle here, right? Emery? Some great power is going to be leveled. Some great power is going to be leveled. Those are all good thoughts. Those are all good thoughts, okay? I think it's really here talking about resistance and obstacles. That there's a great obstacle in the way it, to, Ze, to Zerubbabel. He looks at rebuilding the temple as impossible because there's this mountain in the way. How am I going to get over that mountain? And God says, don't worry about that. I'm going to flatten that mountain of obstacles. Make it a plane so you will be able to accomplish. And once, once they actually get back to rebuilding the temple, it's interesting how easily, you know, we'll study that when we get to, back to uh, Ezra, but... Um, it's, it's interesting how quickly that happens and, and easily that happens. God makes that possible, not human might or power. Okay, so to come back to our idea, our main idea, God makes the impossible possible. What looked impossible to, to Zerubbabel, God said, I'll make that possible through, through my spirit. Now, name some tasks God has given us that sometimes might seem to us like they're impossible. To accomplish. Raising kids. <laughs> <laughs> raising kids. You, you must have heard that sermon last week. Yeah. So raising kids can be can be uh, quite the challenge. Good. What else? Uh, so I said. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Yeah. Nobody's gonna listen. Nobody's interested. Evangelism doesn't work. It's impossible. What else? Fine. Just being consistent in our daily walk with God. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just being consistent. Can we really do that? Can we really keep serving the Lord? I mean, it's, it's like a mountain, right? It's like a mountain in front of us. I want to serve the Lord, but look at, I've got all these habits. There are all these people around me. They're tempting me. Satan is trying to bring me down constantly. It's a mountain of objectives in front of me, uh, of uh, obstacles before me. Good. What, what else? Yes, ma'am? Sharing God's work with your family who are believers. That's very difficult. That's hard, isn't it? It's very hard. God asks us to do so many things that are hard. Why has He got to do that? Why can't He just ask us to do things that are easy and we can just teach some watered-down um, consumer Christianity gospel like, like is happening in some places and uh, you know, just adapt the gospel to us instead of us adapt our lives to, to God. But that's not how God work. God asks us to do things that are seemingly impossible, doesn't He? Good. Anything else? Yeah, Get, it, giving up our worldly desires. Yeah, and um, actually coming to the point where you, you, can, you can learn to crucify those worldly desires. Like Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, um, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and with its desires. You mean I can learn to hate sin and not be attracted to it anymore? Yes. If you want to overcome sin, that's, that's the way you have to, the path you have to take. Well, it's impossible. 
It's a mountain, that's for sure. Especially in our day and time, coming together on Sundays and Wednesdays or getting together to edify one another, it's hard for people now. Yeah. Or the, the obstacles are television, baseball games, sure. things sure. like that. Distractions. You know, just like the parable of the sower and the seed that was sown on the thorny ground, you know, and all the cares of the world and riches and so forth that choke out the word. Those are all good thoughts. Very, very, very good. Why do these tasks, all this stuff y'all told me, why do they seem impossible to us? I think a lot of it's uncertainty. Not knowing okay. how it's going to work out. The yeah. humans, we want to know before we start how it's going to work out, yeah. how it's going to work out. Yeah. We don't like to do things where we're not sure the outcome. It's so risky, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, what if Zerubbabel and Joshua just started working on the temple? What's going to happen? You know, uh, it's this fear of the unknown. Yeah, Emery. So that, I call that FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Okay. And so FUD has a tremendous ability that because we don't know what's gonna happen, we don't know the outcome, we don't yeah. know how to overcome something, <clears throat> we don't do it. Yeah. So the trust in God is saying, I know who this is. Now if, if Satan yeah. Against us, then I, I love that. that. Well, Maybe I'll have to come up with a sermon sometime and just call it FUD. <laughs> you know, that would be really intriguing. Yeah, I'll take one more comment. I think a lot of times, um, whenever we think that something's impossible, and we get not just like the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, but you know, when you, you try to do something and then you constantly fail at it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like say, like um, the lady said over here about, you know, coming to church and everything. You miss one one day, it's a slippery slope, you know? It just, one day becomes two Sundays, becomes three Sundays, and then all of a sudden you're not going to church anymore. It's it's that, that's what makes it seem impossible, is yeah. because you let it happen once, and then after it happens once, you let it happen again, and then it just, it feels like you're just in a hole. That's how you start any bad habit, it's just one time. And then once a habit sets in, it's, it's very difficult to overcome. What I was wanting to get at here, why these tasks seem impossible, is because we're trusting in human might and power. And remember what God told uh, Zerubbabel here, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And so God will accomplish that which he desires to accomplish in our life if we'll trust him and let him work through us. Now, what I want to do is put up a number of passages up on the screen to drive home this point. Ephesians 3, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Don't forget. You know, just like Zerubbabel didn't need to forget, this temple can be rebuilt and far more than what I'm able to imagine God is able to do regarding this temple or the future temple. Uh, God is able to do beyond what we can even imagine beyond really what we have the faith even to ask. That's, that's what he's saying. All the, you think of all the things you, you could ask God for. You don't have faith to even ask Him what He's even able to do. He's able to do more than you can even come up with to ask. That's how powerful He is. You've probably heard of this verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Through Christ who strengthens me. That's, that's the emphasis. All the things that God has asked me to do, however difficult, I can do those, but I can do them through, through, through Christ. 2 Corinthians 3, 5, not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, right? Just like the oil from those lamps. It wasn't going to run. If you've got two olive trees pouring oil, you're not going to run out of oil, right? So we don't have to worry about the adequacy. God's going to make us sufficient for all things. We're weak, right? We're just flesh. We're very limited. We run out of willpower by lunch time. <laughs> you know, willpower is, it, it runs out, let's be honest. Uh, but, but, but God never runs out of his strength and, and of his support and of his power. Matthew 19, Jesus um, Jesus had talked to the rich young ruler, and then he had said, 
it is easier for a rich man to go to heaven than for what? A camel to go through the eye of a needle. And that doesn't mean the eye of a needle that you sew with. The needle was a small opening into the, the, through the wall of a city. And an individual could go through that opening or something like that. You could get a camel through that eye, but he probably had to, you had to take his, all the stuff off of him and he had to get on his knees and basically crawl through that needle. It's very difficult. So Jesus said it's easier for a rich man to go to heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And the disciples said, well, who then can be saved? Jesus said, with people this is impossible. But with God all things are possible. Powerful. I think, I think the idea is the, the needle of the entrance into the wall, but that's, you know, I could still be wrong on that, but I don't, I, don't think that, I don't think that's the idea of the surgeon's needle, but I'll go back and look at Luke. That's, that's a good point. Anyway, that was all beside the point anyway. Um, Ms. Debbie? Yeah, I was just thinking that's just a, that scripture we read in Zechariah. It's just awesome about yeah. that God will bring the mountain down, and I never thought about it because there's another scripture about... Right here, right here. Well, y'all are looking right here. I'm looking right here. So in this passage, in Matthew 17, um, the, there, there was this man that came to Jesus, and he said, I have a son who has a demon, and your, you know, your disciples couldn't cast out the demon. And uh, he cast the demon out, and the disciples said, well, why couldn't we do it? And he said, because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. I don't think he was talking about literally moving mountains. A mountain represents something very difficult. And Jesus' point is with a small amount of genuine faith, we can do that which seems impossible to us. I think that's, that's Jesus' point in, in that passage. So, let's come back now uh, to Zechariah and uh, look, look at the rest of this. Look in verse 8. I kind of got a little bit ahead of myself, so I'm going to back up a little bit. Uh, verse 8, Also the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord which range to and fro throughout the earth. So the, this passage, verse 10, is very famous, the beginning where it says, Who has despised the, the day of small things? Have you all heard that before? Uh, what is the small things being referenced to here? In the context of the return? I know y'all know. Somebody who has an answer, you wanna speak up? Anybody? Nobody else? The small? What was small that they didn't care to finish the temple? Right? They, remember when they laid the foundations? There were those who were celebrating, but there were those who remembered the old temple, right? And what were they doing? They were weeping. And then there, there was just this noise of like rejoicing and loud weeping all at the same time. You could hear it a long way off, and, and you couldn't tell whether there was rejoicing or crying that was going on. So there, there were those who were very sad because this is not going to be like Solomon's temple. It was going to be small and to them insignificant. Do you think that's part of why they gave up? What's the point anyway? Brian talked about that some, I think, last week. What's the point anyway? It's just a pathetic little temple we're building. Can we sometimes get that attitude about things God has asked us to do? What's the point? I mean, it's not like I'm not accomplishing something big here. It doesn't seem significant to me. What's the point in getting involved in the work here at Palm Springs Drive? You know, there's only like over 100 people here. It's not like we're going to convert the whole town. So why do I need to expend all my energy on something like that? I'll just go to work on my house. You see, it's the same attitude we can have. Something that's very small in our eyes can be very significant in God's eyes, right? Very significant in God's eyes. Um, 
we're not stopping to look at just every little point here, but uh, let's, let's finish up here. Uh, verse, verses 11 through 14 is uh, where he, he asks in verse 11 and 12, tell me more about these two olive trees. I don't get it. I, I, I don't understand these. And in verse 13, so he answered me saying, do you not know who these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. All right, question for y'all. Who do you think the two anointed ones represent? Ms. B? Joshua and Jeroboam. I think, I think you're right. That would be the immediate thing that would jump out because those are the two leaders, the civic leader and uh, the religious leader. Why would they be called anointed ones? They're in charge. Ma'am? They're in charge. They're in charge, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, and they anointed uh, kings and leaders. They were anointed. Prophets were anointed. That's right. And priests were anointed. They were okay. all anointed. That's right. So, you know, the, the role of king and priest were two of the roles of those who were anointed. Now, Zerubbabel wasn't officially the king, uh, but he was the leader. He was the civic leader, and he was in the Davidic lineage. And, of course, Joshua the high priest was one who was, who was anointed. So that kind of ties us back in and, and adds another layer of meaning to these two olive trees that will make this thing happen by the provision of the Spirit, and that is these two leaders, Zerubbabel and Joshua, will, will accomplish this work. Now I want to bring us back to our main point that God makes the impossible possible. That's the last th thought I want to leave ringing in your mind, and we do have... A uh, little over two minutes. Does anybody have, I know I didn't cover chapters one through four in detail. There's a lot that we left out. I really wanted to make it practical and easy. But does anybody have any questions or any comments from anything we talked about today? <coughs> Matt? So then uh, the two olive trees, the joint of those two, that would represent us, faithful, to the three God's work, right? Is that I think in a general sense, yeah. I think in a general sense, and maybe especially those who the Lord uses as leaders, you know, to accomplish His will might be a, a more specific application, but yeah, um, absolutely. And, you know, God does accomplish through His Spirit, but He uses human kind of channels, right? A, a, humans as channels uh, of that power and of His working. So we need to let the Lord work through us. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Debbie, then Brian. Well, I was just thinking that whole idea of the mountain being made into a plain is just such a refreshing thought because, you know, when we see a mountain in our life, no matter what it is, whether it's a, a, a job opportunity or a difficult person in our lives or, you know, we just don't know what to do about things. So many times we think, oh, well, we have to pray. I think this way. I have to pray and I have to wait to see if God shows me what to do. Mm -hmm. I think it's about what I need to do. Mm -hmm. But it's really refreshing to me to think that it, but God can just level that mountain and make it plain. And it might not have anything to do with me. That's, that's what's so encouraging. That, that's a hard thing for me. Because I'm like a person of plan and action and... Hey, let's figure out, you know, I want to figure out step one, two, and three and how we're going to, you know, get around this mountain right here. And uh, Holly's good at reminding me, you know, trust the Lord. And every time I ask her about something, she says, just pray, just pray, just pray, just pray. Trust the Lord. And she's absolutely right. That's, that's what you need to do because he can level that plane in ways that we can't really come up with in our mind. We just trust the Lord. Brian? Um, yeah, I just thought about this connection with Isaiah 40 because in, <clears throat> he mentions Zechariah that the mountain is going to be made into a plain to make it clear for Zerubbabel, this guy in the Davidic line, to build the temple. And then John the Baptist in Isaiah 40, when it says a voice is calling, clear the way to the Lord in the wilderness, the very next verse says, let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low and let the rough ground become a plain. Hmm. So you have John the Baptist also 
clearing the way for Jesus, mm-hmm. right, this descendant of Zerubbabel to come build the, the spiritual temple. So just so deep shows God's brilliance. Kind of. I wish I had saw that. <laughs> that is really good. That's a great point to go out on. So, all right, ring, ring the bell. Uh, please read Zechariah 5 through 8 uh, for next Sunday. No class on Wednesday because we're having singing.